of y'all are smiling. I see Jesus in you. I have to work on that a little bit. Send the light. offering that's taken up that you would use it to, to further your kingdom. We pray that it would be used to send the light all over the world that people could know you as Lord and Savior. And Lord, we pray for, for those of us who give that we would recognize that you want to use us to send that light too. Lord, we pray for those in our own community and our own family, our friends that don't know you as Lord and Savior. Lord, we pray that you would give us opportunity and to help us to recognize the opportunity to lead them to you, and that they could come to know you as we know you, and to love you, and to praise you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. We do pray for souls to be saved, and for the baptismal waters to be stirred. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And be seated. <laughs>
message that Jesus saves and uh, he's still saving lives today and I hope that you know him as your Lord and Savior today I want you to pray for a young man brother Mark and I got to talk to this week his name's Terrence and Terrence needs Jesus and so I pray that Terrence will come to realize that it's not through being a good person it's not through religion but it is only through Christ Jesus that we can be saved. Well, it's good to see everybody this morning. It's good to be back at our home church. Last weekend we were gone, and Val Austin had a great time over there preaching their D-Now, and then uh, Sunday morning I was over there uh, with their uh, preaching Sunday morning. Just It was just really good, but it's good, back, good to be back home. Uh, we have a special guest family with us this morning, Get, uh, Kent and Jenny Raker. They, uh, yes, amen. They are home on spring break. Those of you uh, know that uh, the Rakers are at Southwest Seminary and uh, Southwestern Seminary out in Fort Worth and uh, certainly want to pray for the Rakers as they pursue God's call on their life. And so thank you so much for your faithfulness and willingness to be obedient to God's uh, calling on your life. Well, today we're going to be in the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 11. We continue on in our journey through the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 11. Verses 37 through 54. Luke chapter 11, verses 37 through 54. And as you find your place, would you please stand as we honor God's word this morning? Luke chapter 7, or 11, excuse me, 37 through 54. The Bible says, While Jesus was speaking, a Pharisee asked him to dine with him. So he went in and reclined at the table. The Pharisee was astonished to see that he did not first wash before dinner. And the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees cleanse the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You fools! Did not he who made the outside make the inside also? But give as alms those things that are within and beyond everything is clean for you. But woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and every herb and neglect justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Woe to you Pharisees, for you love the best seat in the house or in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. 
Woe to you, for you are like unmarked graves, and people walk over them without knowing it. One of the lawyers answered him, Teacher, in saying these things, you insult us also. And he said, Woe to you, lawyers also, for you load people with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets whom your fathers killed. So you are witnesses, and you consent to the deeds of your fathers, for they killed them, and you build their tombs. Therefore also the wisdom of God said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and persecute, so that the blood of all the prophets shed from the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, it will be required of this generation. Woe to you, lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter yourselves, and you hindered those who were entering. As he went away from there, the scribes and the Pharisees began to press him hard and provoke him to speak about many things, lying in wait for him to catch him in something he might say. Well, let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day you've given us. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would illumine our minds to the truth of your word. Father, keep our minds focused on this very important message that Jesus has for us today. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would come, that you would do warfare over this place as we know the enemy wants to distract us from receiving what you want us to receive today. And I pray, dear Lord Jesus, for anybody who is here today or who is listening by radio, Lord, if they don't know Jesus Christ, I pray that they would turn to you today for salvation. For those of us who do know you, Lord, keep us focused on Christ, and may we find our security and our hope always in you. Lord, we love you, we praise you, and we ask these things in Christ's name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I remember in, I guess it was middle or high school biology, the highlight of biology class was when you finally got to dissect something. And uh, that was always a cool thing to do for teenage boys. And the very first thing that we got to dissect was, of all things, an earthworm. Now, there's a lot of things to see inside of an earthworm, and then we kind of stepped up a little bit, did a fish, and then worked our way up to a frog. Some people got to do a little pig. I never got to do a pig. Uh, I just wanted to say that, you know, you need waking up. I mean, we're just, uh, this time change, so. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it was interesting to dissect things, to see what was on the inside that made that specimen work. And today, we are going to dissect something. But we're not going to dissect a pig or an earthworm. We're going to dissect religion this morning. We're going to dissect religion. You know, in Jesus' time, the, the people that he was the most harshest with were the religious people. Now, you would think that he would have been the harshest with the criminals and the morally corrupt of his day, but that was not the case. It was the religious people, the ones who were devout, moral, they were concerned about keeping God's law. They spoke all the time about God, but these were the ones that Jesus was the most harshest with. In fact, in Mark, uh, Matthew chapter 23, verse 33, speaking to the religious ones, he said, You serpents, you brood of vipers, how are you to escape being sentenced to hell? And then John chapter 8, verse 44, he said, You are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. So we see in the Gospels that Jesus, oftentimes, he identified himself and embraced the sinners, the scum of the earth, those who were rejected by society, but they were willing to repent of their sins. They acknowledged their need for a Savior. Those are the ones that Jesus embraced, it was not the moral upstanding individuals of his day, the religious ones, because they were self-righteous and their hearts were hardened towards him. You know, when we think of religion, often we think of you know big, large Catholic cathedrals like Michelle and I saw in Italy when we traveled there, or we think of, of those mosques that you find in the Middle East, or if you travel to Atlanta now, you'll 
see those mosque shrines built to Hindu gods or when you go to the Chinese restaurant you see those little Buddha statues and they'll have little offerings made to those Buddha statues and that's what we think of when we think of religion. But you know what? You don't have to travel all the way to China. You don't have to travel all the way to Italy to see religion. Because religion is all around us. In fact, we live in one of the most religious places in the entire world, and that is the Deep South. The South is a very religious place. I mean, there's a church on every corner. We all know the right things to say. We know all the right things to do. We are very religious people. And I have said it from this pulpit before. I would venture to say that the South is one of the greatest mission fields in the entire world. But it's one of the hardest mission fields in the entire world because everybody's saved. Everybody's saved. So, this is such an important lesson to us today because, again, we we all, if we're not careful, can be very, very religious. Now, this follows on the heels of what we spoke about two weeks ago in verses 33 through 36 where Jesus spoke of the eyes as a lamp, and uh, not our physical eyes, of course, but he spoke of, of the fact that if you, have, if you are open to receive the message of the gospel, if you are open to Jesus, your eyes will serve as a lamp in this sense. The, the light of Jesus will be allowed into every part of your body. But you see, religion, on the other hand, it closes its eyes. It closes its eyes to Jesus. Jesus is not the focus. Jesus is not the focus. And that's what Jesus teaches us today. So he follows up with an illustration of what it looks like to have bad eyes. And it's marked by religion. So we're going to dissect religion this morning. So let's get started. In verse 37 through 38, we see this religion keeps the rules. Religion keeps the rules. It says there in the text that a Pharisee invites Jesus to dine with him, and so Jesus goes with him. You know what? Jesus hung out with sinners, but he also hung out with religious people as well. And this Pharisee, they were the separated ones. It was in Jesus' time, there was about 6,000 of them. They were the fundamentalist of the day. I mean, they kept the law to the T. They were, they were strict. Now, they were not priests, by the way. Pharisees were laymen. But they were very devoted to keeping God's law. And what happened was, is they were devoted to keeping God's written law, but in order to protect the written law, they developed a bunch of man-made laws known as the oral law. And that oral law basically was uh, served as a fence. It was a fence that guarded the written law. And what's amazing is they had all these additional man-made laws, but did you know that in the Old Testament, in the law, there were 613 laws found in the Old Testament, but yet they wanted more. And that was their problem. Their religion was all about keeping The rules. And so the people of the day, they looked to the Pharisees and the scribes as their spiritual authorities. They looked to them for direction. And this Pharisee, he has Jesus over to dinner and he is absolutely shocked because Jesus does something. Jesus breaks the rules. Jesus was good at doing that. He broke the rules. And I believe he did it on purpose because he wants to teach this man a lesson. He's trying to extend mercy and grace to this man, and so he breaks the rules. And the rule he broke was he didn't wash his hands before he ate dinner. Now, growing up, you, you know, your mama probably told you before you, before you uh, pick up that piece of fried chicken, you better make sure that your hands are washed. Because you, you, know, you have germs on your hands. But this was not the issue with the Pharisees. It was not for sanitary reasons. But, but it was all a ceremonial sort of thing because they felt like uh, as they went throughout the day, as they passed through the marketplaces, and as they, as they interacted among all the sinful people in the world, that they would be defiled. 
And so before they ate, they would make sure that they washed. And they had specific ways that they had to wash. I mean, you had to hold your hands up in a certain way, and then you'd hold your hands down in a certain way, and there was a specified amount of water that you had to use. All these rules that you had to do. And if you were spiritual and if you loved the Lord, you washed your hands correctly. But Jesus breaks the rules. Religion keeps the rules. Religion, understand, demands that you keep rules. Man-made rules. We call it sometimes legalism. It's earning. It's attempting to earn or keep God's favor by doing or not doing certain things. That's what religion is all about. I heard about this little boy. He, he was raised in a particular religion that says you could not eat shrimp. And he believed that if you ate shrimp, you would die and go to hell. So whenever he was at school, if they sh- served shrimp, he wouldn't eat it because he didn't want to go to hell, but he would give his shrimp to his classmates. <laughs> so he didn't want to go to hell, but he didn't care if his classmates went to hell. That's religion. So religion is based on man-made rules, but also this, religion judges people on the basis of keeping those rules. Hey, if you keep the rules, then you're good. If you keep my convictions, see, it's, 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 you have these convictions and you impose those convictions on everybody else, and your standard for spirituality is whether or not people keep the rules. So number one, religion keeps the rules. Number two, in verses 39 through 41, religion washes the external. It washes the external. Jesus here, he says to him, Now, you Pharisees, you cleanse the outside of the the cup and of the dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. And then he says, you fools, do you not understand that God has created both the inside and the outside and he's most concerned about your inside? Because when your inside gets right, it takes care of the outside. I remember when I was in seminary back when Hurricane Katrina hit uh, down there in New Orleans and and the the Mississippi area. uh, our, Our seminary that I was at up in North Carolina, we took a trip down to New Orleans and we helped to clean up. And it was just amazing when you went down there because under all the overpasses, underpasses, there was just all these cars. I mean, they had, it was like graveyards for cars that had been flooded. Well, months later, those cars began to flood into the markets. And what they would do is they would clean up the outside, but they didn't deal with all the problems internally. And that's what religion does is is religious people wear a really good mask. They they look very very good on the outside, but really there's no real love for God in people. There's no real repentance. In reality, they're just fakes and phonies and their internal corruption is covered up with external morality and ritual. They do all the right things, they say all the right things, and they avoid all the bad things, but really there's no true love in their heart for God because their inside has never been transformed. If you really want to know if somebody loves God, don't just look at them. Spend time with them. Spend time with them because what's on the inside is going to come out. And so often do we not judge people by the way they look. And we say, yeah, that one right there. You can tell, boy, they, they, they're dressed right. They look right. But this one over here, they, they don't fit the mold, so they don't love God. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, the Bible says, The Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Religion washes the external. Number three, religion emphasizes the trivial. It emphasizes the trivial. Verse 42, Jesus begins with a series of six woes. Now, in the Bible, when you see that word woe, that is a warning. That is an indicator of coming judgment. He says, Woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and every herb and neglect justice and the love 
of God. Now in the law, the book of Leviticus spelled out that you would have to give a tithe of, if, if you were a farmer, you would give a tithe of your crops. But nowhere did it ever say that you had to go all the way to your spice rack and get your spices out and tithe of your spices. But you see, the Pharisees, they were so devout that they went beyond the law and they tithed even of their spices. But yet, they, they, were so, they were so focused on the trivial things, but they neglected the most important things, and that was love for God and a love for people. And the very ones, the Pharisees, that tithed all the way to the point of their spices, they would neglect helping their own parents out by saying, hey, all of my money has been devoted to the Lord. Oh, they were so, so detailed on the the small trivial things but yet they weren't giving attention to the most important things religious people focus on the minors ladies you better not wear pants can't can't do that men you better not have facial hair i've heard that men you're not allowed to have beards oh by the way We are to begin church at 11, and yes, we have to finish by 12 (laughs) o'clock. But at the same time that we say, you better not wear pants and we better be done by 12, we will gossip. And we will lie. And when we get done at 12, because we got to get done by 12, we'll hurry and go to the all-you-can-eat buffet and gorge ourselves with food. You know what that's called? Gluttony. Religion emphasizes the trivial, and so we focus on all these trivial things, and all the while we neglect a love for God and a love for people. Are we still okay? We're doing good? All right, verse 43. Number four, religion wants the glory. Religion wants the glory. Notice verse 43. Woe to you Pharisees, for you love the best seat in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. You see, the Pharisees who were very religious, they got the important seats in the synagogues because they were the spiritual ones. They were the big tithers, so they got the big seats in the synagogue. And their seats were up front and it faced everybody else because they were the important people. And they wanted the glory. And they liked all the special greetings they would get when they were in the marketplaces. They liked it when people came up to them and said, Oh, Rabbi. Oh, Holy One. They craved the honor. And they could care less about the people that they were supposedly supposed to be leading. And when we have a religious spirit, we get caught up in being honored. It's about us. And we like the titles. Reverend. Bishop. Titles. It's not about God's glory. It's about our glory. Number five, verse 44. Religion defiles the people. Religion defiles the people. Notice verse 44. Woe to you, for you are like unmarked graves, and people walk over them without knowing it. Now, in the Old Testament, the law said that if you came in contact with a dead body, a corpse, you were ceremonially unclean. You were defiled. And so there was a, there was a prescribed ceremony you would have to go through, a time of purification. And so in order to make sure that you didn't come in contact with a the body, they made sure that they marked the graves well. So that you would see a grave, so that you would stay away from the grave. They talk about whitewashed tombs. They would stand out. But Jesus said, addressing the, the, the Pharisees, He said, you are, like, you are like unmarked graves. You are defiled because, because you're dead spiritually. And people come in contact with you and they don't even realize it and they're defiled. They're corrupted by being in contact with you. He said in Matthew chapter 23, verse 15, he said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte. And when he becomes a proselyte, you make him as twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. So religion, it corrupts people. It doesn't make people holy. It makes them unholy. 
Because this is what religion often does. Number one, it turns people away from the Lord because of its hypocrisy. How many people right now, you probably have people in your family, they don't want to have anything to do with God and the church because they're fed up with all the hypocrisy of religion. So they're being defiled by religion. But also it defiles people because it turns them into legalists. And as legalists, they, they are deceived into thinking that they can earn God's favor and forgiveness by doing all the right things. Or even as believers, let's be honest, because you can be saved and fall into the trap of religion. And you can say, hey, I'm doing a good job because I keep all the rules. I'm secure in Christ because I do all the right things. I read my Bible, I come to church, I cross all my T's and I dot all my I's. I'm good. Religion defiles the people. In verses 45 through 46, we get our sixth mark of religion. Religion increases the burden. Religion increases the burden. This is one of the lawyers answered him, Teacher, in saying these things, you insult us also. So apparently there were some scribes there, and they're listening to this conversation. And this scribe, who the scribes, Unlike the Pharisees, the, the scribes were the one who interpreted the law. They were the experts of the law. And he's offended. You know what I have found? Because I've, I've been a religious person. Religious people are easily offended. And this guy says, Jesus, man, man, you just offended that guy and you've offended us too by the things that you are, are saying. You know what? Religious people are easily angered when you mess with their idols. The Pharisees and the scribes, they were idolaters because their idol was their religion. Instead of their, 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 uh, their worship being about worshiping the one that, that, that deserved all worship, it was all about the system. That was their God. And this guy comes and he says, you know what? You've, you've upset us by what you're saying. And, and, and Jesus here, he, he says, you know, you're just adding burdens to the people. You, you add all these burdens to the people. I mean, let's just face it. I mean, 613 laws, that was a lot, lot to keep up with in the Old Testament. But on top of that, you've added all these other rules and you expect all the people to follow the rules. But by the way, you don't keep the rules yourself. Religion increases the burden. And they had all kinds of Sabbath rules and all these things that just added weight on the backs of the people, but yet they found loopholes to avoid their own rules. Legalism it adds a burden. It adds a weight. Number seven. Verses 47 through 51, religion hates the truth. Religion hates the truth. Jesus there, he, he speaks of how the, the Pharisees, the religious scribes, how they had decorated the tombs of the prophets, the prophets of old. And so it gave the appearance that these prophets were honoring the prophets of old. But he said, you know what? You're just like your fathers who killed the prophets because just like your forefathers, you don't like the truth. You hate the truth and you hate the messengers of the truth. Think about Isaiah and Jeremiah. They were hated because of the truth that they declared. And Jesus, He knew the hearts of these people and He knew what was in their hearts. The Pharisees hated Jesus and they wanted to kill Him and eventually they did. What did they do to John the Baptist? They killed him because he stood for truth. Religion hates the truth. Number eight, religion misleads the blind. Verse 52, religion misleads the blind. Notice what Jesus says there in verse 52. Woe to you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter yourselves, and you hindered those who were entering the religious people, the Pharisees and the scribes, the quote-unquote experts, were locking people out of the kingdom of God because they were forcing people to have to go through religion to get to God. And you can't get to God through religion. 
And so religion misleads the blind because it's the blind trying to lead the blind. Religion is blind to the truth, therefore it can't offer sight to the blind. Religion is, is, it can't offer any kind of life because there's no life in dead religion. It can't offer truth because there's no true truth in religion. And there is no freedom that comes through religion because the only thing that you'll get by being religious is bondage. That's all you'll get. So religion misleads the blind. You know what? In this world today, in Donaldsonville, Georgia, there are people who are lost. And according to Ephesians chapter 2, they are spiritually dead and they cannot see. If you're saved today, you know what it was like before you came to faith in Christ. You were blind. And there's blind people all over this world and we don't need to lead them to religion. We need to lead them to a relationship with Jesus Christ. Number nine, religion hardens the heart. Notice what is the outcome here in verses 53 through 54. It says, Jesus left and the scribes and the Pharisees, they quickly meet together because they want to come up with a plan how they can do away with Jesus. This was an opportunity for them to say, hey, we're lost. All we have is religion. We do all the right things and we look very spiritual, but our insides are corrupt and we need somebody to save us from ourselves. But that's not what they did. Their hearts were hardened and they refused to repent. And you know what, church? That's the truth about religion. Religion never softens the heart. Religion always hardens the heart. Because religious people, here's the deal, listen to this. Religious people never are willing to acknowledge their problem. Because they don't see they have a problem. And all of our problem is what? We all have the same problem. We're sinners. And until you get to that place where you're willing to acknowledge that you're a sinner, you will never run to the Savior. And religious people are self-righteous. And that's why we have people that fill our churches everywhere and the name of Jesus is really not precious to them because they don't recognize their true need for Jesus because they're self-righteous, because all they have is religion. So the final mark of religion is this. Religion, it damns the soul. Self-righteous people, because they never see their need for a Savior, they never run to Jesus, and if you never ever run to Jesus with all of your sin, you will not go to heaven. You will never have eternal life. So very quickly... In way of review, religion keeps the rules. Religion washes the external. Religion emphasizes the triv trivial. Religion wants the glory. Religion defiles the people. Religion increases the burden. It hates the truth. Religion misleads the blind. It hardens the heart. And finally, religion outside of Jesus damns the soul. So very quickly, in the way of application... Three points of application. Number one, if today, if you are filled with religion, repent of your religion. Repent of your religion. In other words, turn from your religion and embrace the Savior. Turn away from all your rulemaking, all your achievements, your condemning and your judging and your self-righteousness. You have all your I's dotted and all your T's are crossed, but your heart is not right because you don't have Jesus. Repent of your religion. And again, church people, we can be saved. We can truly be saved and fall into this trap of religion. And maybe that's you today. You're saved. You had that time in your life where you recognized you were a sinner and there was no hope for you outside of Christ. And so you ran to Jesus and you were forgiven of, your, of all your sins, but yet over time you've turned back to religion. And it's no longer about the relationship, but it's about the religion. It's about the stale, cold, 
dead orthodoxy, keeping all the rules, doing all the right things, but there's no joy in your life. If that's you today, repent of your religion. Number two, run to Jesus. Run to Jesus. So many times I talk to people about their need for the Savior and they say, I know I need to get right, but before I can get right, I've got to fix things up in my life and then I'll go to Jesus. No, you run to Jesus. Run to Him with all of your sin, with all of your problems, with all of your issues. Run to Jesus. Don't run to religion. Run to uh, Jesus. And then thirdly and finally, realize your opposition. You know what? If you truly love Jesus Christ and you stand for truth and you don't preach religion but you speak the truth, you will be opposed. Because religious people, they won't like it. They won't like it. The Bible says, for all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Will suffer persecution. So repent of your religion, run to Jesus, and recognize or realize your opposition. Let us pray. Father, Lord Jesus, we know, dear Lord, that you didn't come to save religious people. You didn't come to save those who had everything right, who didn't recognize their need for a Savior, but you came to save the sick. And Lord, today I pray for that individual who comes today and they're very religious, so they've been a member of this church all their life. They bring in a big Bible and they come to Sunday school, but inside their heart is corrupt because they've never truly been transformed by the Savior. Lord, if there's anybody today who meets that description, I pray that they would repent of religion and they would run to Jesus. Those of us who are saved, but yet we have fallen back into this trap of legalism and religion. Lord, may we turn from that and recognize that our security and our acceptance is not based upon our performance, but it is solely in who we are in Jesus Christ, and we thank you for that. And Lord, help us to be bold. Help us to stand firm, knowing that yes, we will be opposed when we speak forth truth, but it's a badge of honor as we suffer for our King. Lord, we pray that your way, your will would be accomplished in this time of invitation. And we ask these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. I'm going to invite you to stand as we have our invitation today. If today you say, you know what, I want to get my heart right with the Lord and I'm tired of playing the religious game and I want to receive true life today, I want to receive Jesus today, would you come today? If there's a burden you're carrying and you want to come to the altars and pray, would you do that? If there's some decision that you need to make that has nothing to do with what I've talked about today, now is the time to be obedient to the Lord's call as we sing hymn number 434. Hymn number 434.